So this webinar is on force measurement uncertainty. My name is Henry Zumbrun, and I'm the president of Morehouse Instrument Company. Dilip Shaw uh, with E equals M MC3, and, and I have been doing uh, force classes, uh, weekly trainings, and that schedule is available online on our website at www.mhforce.com. We have full week training. It's very difficult in you know an hour to go through the whole concept of measurement uncertainty. So a lot of this is going to be an overview of what's going on, uh, some recommendations on how to calculate measurement uncertainty for the parameter of force. If anybody has any questions after the webinar, or if you're listening to this recorded, uh, my contact information is below. Uh, it's on the screen at 717-843-0081. That's, uh, you can contact me Monday through Friday, Eastern Standard Time, between 8 o'clock and 5 o'clock. And then uh, the email address, if you want a PDF copy of this, you know, um, please use that email address, and we're happy to send uh, PDF copies. So what Morehouse does, uh, we manufacture force calibration products. Uh, we calibrate force measuring equipment using standards with very low uncertainties. These standards allow us to lower the uncertainties of equipment sent to us for calibration. And overall, we our goal is to help make uh, labs make better measurements. And we do this with uh, very distinct capabilities for both force and torque. Our force capability, we offer uh, deadweight primary standards calibrations accurate to 0.002% or 20 parts per million of applied force up to 120,000 pounds. And other force calibrations, we offer up to 2.25 million or 10 meganewton, and that's known to 0.01% or 100 parts per million. On the torque side of things, uh, we offer, uh, we have the second most accurate standard in the world. Uh, PTB has the most accurate standard. This standard came from NPL. We offer torque calibrations from up to 2 kilonewton meters, accurate to 0.0025%, 25 parts per million of applied torque. So during the 60 minute webinar, there's a lot of slides to go through. We're going to cover measurement uncertainty basics. We're going to cover scope examples. We're going to cover how to calculate CMC for force using our free Excel template. In this specific example, we're going to cover ASTM if you had a calibration performed using the ASTM standard. If the template also works to use nonlinearity, uh, hysteresis, SEB, or ISO 376 calibration. So if you're not working to ASTM E74 and want to use it for another method, the template can, can be used for another method. So before we begin, uh, the specific questions that I have um, for, for people or things to consider uh, when you're making force measurements are, are you confident that your equipment is calibrated properly with the appropriate adapters? Is your force calibration provider making statements of compliance without taking into consideration the uncertainty of the measurement? How have you calculated? Uh, if you're accredited, how have you calculated your calibration and measurement capability? Um, it, have you done it properly? Um, that's taking into uh, account degrees of freedom. We've seen several, and the whole reason for this webinar is, is, is we give that weekly class and people come to us with these examples uh, and they get guidance by the accreditation bob bodies. They get guidance by people that really do not know the parameter of force as well as they should, and they do not give them the proper guidance. So they give them um, values from, you know, CRC or some other some other places uh, where they use uh, different templates, and they're not correct. So we're hoping to make this webinar, we're hoping to at least give you the essential tools. <laughs> We're hoping to give you the essential tools to perform and make the CMC calculations. So to start, 
we need to we need to look at metrological traceability and that's the property of a measurement result whereby the result can be related to a reference through a documented unbroken chain of calibrations each contributing to the measurement uncertainty this is found uh in the vim the international vocabulary metrology section 2.4.1 and when we look at measurement uncertainty, all measurements are subject to uncertainty. And a measured value is only complete if the accompanied by a statement of the associated uncertainty. And the uncertainty is, is a measure of how close a particular test result, the product of one laboratory, is to the true value. So when we look at this in the high, hierarchy form or the pyramid, uh, it's important to note that the measurement uncertainty data is cumulative uh, from one level to, of the hierarchy to another. So us as Morehouse, if we send our instrumentation to NIST, our uncertainty can never be less. The uncertainty we would report to you can never be less than the lab that calibrated our uncertainty. So the way this works, everything is traceable back to SI units. Then you have national metrology institutes. You have your NMIs. And then there's lots of laboratories where that have primary reference standards, such as dead weights and other and other. Uh, other standards and then typically you go down to the accredited calibration supplier level working standards and then field measurements and to the right is general general uncertainties um, you know NIST is four to five parts per million we're around eight uh, for one a standard uncertainty the accredited calibration suppliers are usually around 0.02 they may be better they may be around 0 0.015 uh, 0 0.0125 working standards and then typically field measurements are you know about a half half percent so, and then we look at, when we start talking about these uh, measurements and we, we look at the CMC and, and calculating this, which is required for the, uh, the ISO 17025 standard and many, many of the accreditation bodies, they want you to calibrate your calibration and measurement capability. And this, this, cal this cal calculation of the CMC often includes the following standard and certainty contributors. We have repeatability, resolution, reproducibility, reference standard uncertainty, reference standard stability, environmental, and environmental factors. And the easiest thing I can say to remember these, I call them five R's and an E. So, and then we look at this. Uh, if we examine the CMC, the calibration and measure capability using a primary standard. So Morehouse does the calibration. We use our primary standards and we, we do a load cell in accordance with ASTM E74. Uh, this one says specifically on here, right here, U-7643. This is one of our reference standards that we have. So we do a calibration on this on this standard, and we use the CMC. We account for all of the, the five R's and the uh, E, and we look at everything. We look at the uncertainty budget, and we take a look at the reference standard uncertainty. And of the total budget, our, the reference standard using dead weights is is 14.43% contribution to the overall uncertainty. And the expanded uncertainty for this is 0 0.041 pounds. Now, if we look at the accredited, you do not use Morehouse. You send it to an accredited calibration supplier. Same instrument, same type of instrument. And all we've done here really is we've just changed the, the number at the bottom, uh, the accredited calibration supplier number at the bottom. And if you look at this, it becomes dominant, 95.74%, or the expanded uncertainty becomes 4.03. So looking at both labs, you have a choice, you primary standards versus secondary standards, and you're getting an E74 calibration or even another calibration. You look at the CMC, add, that contributes towards the overall uncertainty. You look at the repeatability, uh, the good CMCs, the, the better the equipment, the better the repeatability of the device. If you look at all that together, an instrument gets sent to us, 10K instrument gets sent to us for calibration, expanded uncertainty, could theoretically on a good load cell be 0.41 pounds at 10,000. But if you look at it on the expanded uncertainty side from the accredited calibration supplier, we're looking at that expanded uncertainty when you factor in everything's going to be about 4.03 pounds. Uh, roughly you know, it's almost 10 times higher. So it's just something to, to consider when you're looking at uh, calibration suppliers.
And then you talk about why is it why is it so important? Why do these standards want us to calculate measurement uncertainty? Why do we have to do calibration and measurement capability? Well, the new ISO standard just came out in December, uh, came out over a week ago, and uh, this is in reference to the 2005 standard, not the 2017. But in section 5.10.4.2, it states when statements of compliance are made, the uncertainty of the measurement shall be taken into account. So if you want the really the importance of measurement uncertainty is is in, in is if you want to to say something is intolerance or passes calibration, you need to take into account the uncertainty of the measurement. It's clear. How do you know if you do? How do you know if something is in or out of tolerance if you do not? calculate the measurement uncertainty properly and how do you know what what your process uncertainty is without those numbers so measurement uncertainty ri measurement risk and uncertainty uh, how to lower both you know you can do this by uh, using the right calibration provider and have them replicate how the device is being used that is very important if you send some something off for calibration and you don't use the proper adapters um, or equipment, you're going to get different numbers. The lab performing the calibration is going to give you much different numbers than when you use it in practice. Having competent technicians. Um, and then what I was just showing earlier is lowering your uncertainties through your calibration provider. So here's a list. We have how good does your calibration provider need to be, the TUR table. You know, just difference. If you have different tolerances you require, that's this is a table on how good something needs to be, assuming the resolution and repeatability is, is what it is. So, but if we look at why is it really important back to the tolerance and we show a graph, if we have, uh, we're applying 10,000 pounds and in this scenario, the instrument reads 10,004 pounds when 10,000 pounds is applied, the calibration provider with the lower measurement uncertainty can make the claim that the instrument is intolerant. So here on the left is here's an instrument in, on the left here is in our equipment standard uncertainty 0.12 uh, on the right would be you know your credit calibration supplier with a standard uncertainty of you know 2.5 the difference is the one on the left you send something in uh, tolerance is plus or minus five pounds you can say it's intolerance we can say this is intolerance and you don't have an out of tolerance condition the lab on the right cannot say that and if we look at this graphically all this means is we have an instrument measurement uncertainty. We have the true nominal value here, this green line. I'm drawing a yellow line over it. Um, we have the true nominal value. We have the measured value. And then that measured value has an uncertainty, a plus or minus value associated with it. When I say we know our measurements to 0.0016%, that makes that band really small. So we know it plus plus or minus 0.0016. If someone, if a lab says 0.02%, then that band's going to be 0.02. And then you have the tolerance of the instrument. So if the lab... If you send equipment to labs with high uncertainties, it's very possible that they are outside, and that's what that last example showed, that they could be outside the tolerance. And the easiest way, I, I like to simplify this, is, is, you know, we've all parked in spaces where, you know, your door will hit another door. So the lab with the smaller uncertainties will produce larger TURs, giving you more space to be in tolerance, like parking. You know, you know, you go to a parking lot and you have to pull in real tight and you, you have just enough room that you have to, you know, wedge yourself out of the car between cars. And then you come back from shopping or wherever and you see a big dent in your door because the car, car next to you just flung open their door and, and hit it. It's the same thing. There's risk. If you send your instruments to the, the labs with the, you know, without the capable amount of uh, without the uncertainty low enough to make the measurement it's they're gonna they're gonna not be able to pass your equipment just like when you come out from the parking lot you're gonna have a dent in your door so that's simplified uh, we're gonna get more into uh, measurement uncertainty uh, I'm gonna show some examples here this is these are some things to live by uh, some things that should not be done here's an example where the expanded uncertainty it's less than the reference standard uncertainty so they basically say technical remarks the estimated measurement uncertainty is 5.5 pounds which represents an expanded uncertainty and then down here they say hey um, here's here's an expanded uncertainty and they're reporting 4.5 
4.381. So this should never happen. The 4.381, uh, you should never be able to report something and say the expanded uncertainty is less than your estimated measurement uncertainty. That should should not happen. If we look at more scopes, because this is what you're doing. Uh, you're doing the CMC to put values on scopes. You're looking at uh, the right, trying to find the right calibration um, supplier so they can you know meet your requirements so if we look at these scopes this is this is our scope i call it a realistic scope standards are called out such as astm e74 and iso 376 yes we are accredited to do both uh comment references that forces can be applied increasing and decreasing so if you don't have your cal your equipment calibrated and decreasing you cannot certify equipment and decreasing it is important as uh, to report uh, hysteresis um, if you if you're reporting hysteresis, you need to have that. You need your standards calibrated in descending mode. Um, we could talk about scopes all day long. I'm just giving brief overviews of some of, some of the important things. Here's another example. I don't believe this scope. 0.013% of reading is uh, very difficult to obtain. It typically requires one very good load cell a, and a dead weight machine, or changing about two to three standards during calibration. That just, um, and that's down here, load cell comparison, ASTM E74. And we know this company, and we know they're not following the E74 standard. That's all, that's all that needs to be said about this. So it's a very much a buyer beware scenario when you're looking at scopes. Um, are they doing what you need them to do? Can you trust them? Um, and that's something that, you know, sometimes it's just unknown. And then uh, this is a common CMC scope. Uh, to show somebody else's uh, numbers, the, uh, the numbers look believable uh, in this one. The CMC numbers look very believable. Uh, accredited lab, I said about 04. Here they're going 035, 05, 04 using load cells. Very believable. And then we get into sc some scopes that are just careless. Um, the wrong units are called out uh, for force here. This scope is calling out torque. Um, pound feet which is uh it's calling out pound feet and then it's referencing e74 so this is just a careless scope um plus to calibrate in accordance with e74 will require dead weight and they're saying up to half a million lots of things wrong another buyer beware uh this example load cells here are called out and they're saying 1.7 grams this scope is saying they're better than nist um another another lab doing force they're saying better than nist who is at uh, four parts per million and yeah it's just another thing so let's get more into the uncertainty side of things because that's why everybody signed up so uncertainty tiers for force calibration primary standards are typically 0 0.001 to 0 0.005 secondary standards 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 uh, working standards 0.1 to 0.5 and uh, devices for force verification typically a half percent to two percent and they're all different down the tier four is your test you know could be your testing machines could be other things tier three would be your force gauges load cells dynamometers uh, tier two could be load cells tier one is dead weight only uh, without intervening mechanisms such as levers hydraulic multipliers or the like so going on um, our technical director and I, um, his name is Ali Reza, and myself, we wrote a paper, and that paper is available for download. If you have the PDF of this or get the PDF of this webinar, you can click the link and download our paper. It goes into a lot of detail under all about all of the things needed to consider for an uncertainty budget, breaks it down, tells you a lot more detail than what we're going to say today. So I highly recommend that paper if you if you want to look at things for force and want for further explanation we're going to in a, in a little while we're going to do it a, a an example for force so getting ready to do an example um to calculate uh measurement uncertainty so we're gonna if we're gonna do it the first thing we're gonna want to do is we're gonna want to specify the measurement process we're gonna want to identify the uncertainty components we're gonna quantify the uncertainty components we're going to want to convert quantities to standard uncertainties, calculate combined standard uncertainty, expand the combined standard uncertainty by coverage factor uh, K, evaluate the expanded uncertainty, and then report the standard uncertainty. 
So looking at standard uncertainty, and this is just a basic overview of the uncertainty till we get to the till we get to the example, but uncertainty calculations. Primary calculations encountered are you know basic statistics. We have mean, range, standard deviation, variance. Standard deviations, we have sample and population. Other statistical methods may be useful, analysis of variance. Uh, this is an Excel as an ANOVA, gauge R and R. Our Excel sheet, which I'm going to show in a little bit, has has gauge R and R section, uh, design of uh, experiments, um, DOE. So, step one was identify the uncertainties in the measurement process. So, determine contribution of factors affecting the measurement process. These could be environment. These could be measuring equipment, measurement setup, adapters, uh, method, procedure, operator, software, calculation method. You could have other constraints, all kinds of things. You, you know, the, the environment's really important. Temperature could fluctuate up and down. Um, that would affect your, you know, a torque arm. So when we go into that, and then we're gonna we're gonna go into classification of the of these uncertainty components. It's they're typically known as either type A or type B. And the simplest way is the type A evaluation method, the method of evaluation of uncertainty of measurement by statistical analysis of a series of observations. Basically, anything using data sets for the most part uh, and the statistical analysis are typically going to fall into type A. And we have examples such as standard deviation of a series of measurements. And when we look at the E74 example, that's what E74 is. The lower limit factor is uh, 2.4 times the standard deviation. Um, other statistical uh, evaluation methods, uh, you know, ANOVA, design of experiments. And then we classify um, A and B, you know, type B evaluation is typically the method of evaluation of uncertainty of measurement by means other than statistical observations. So, you know, things like history of parameter. Other knowledge of the process parameter based on specification. You know, if we don't have anything else, we may have to go back to the manufacturer's specification sheet to do a type B. And then you have torque or load cell, temperature effect, drift, resolution. These can all be classified as, as type B. Uncertainty distributions, uh, correction factors. Uh, here they are. It's just a general slide. You have rectangular, triangular, U-shaped, and resolution. You're going to see these in the in the sheets. And when we look at the sheets, here is one of the sheets. You figure the appropriate coverage factor K based on all the information gathered. Uh, that that back to the NIST eight step here. You know we're going to gather it all. This is using the Wells Satterwhite equation, and then we get that coverage factor. Um, we get our effective degrees of freedom and we multiply our combined uncertainty then by the coverage factor and we get our, our standard, uh, our expanded uncertainty. So calculating four CMCs, guidance documents that are available currently, NCSLI RP12, determining and reporting measurement uncertainties. There's really a lack of a proper uh, guidance document for non-ASTM E74 calibration because the ASTM E74 appendix combined with A2LAR 205 specific requirements calibration laboratory and credit pro program is really what we follow. There's other things you can follow. Uh, right now we're working on a guidance document that was given to A2LA. So what we typically see, oh, and this is what we see happening. Someone puts this together. This is... Um, a typical budget that we see, it's not right. So we see someone gets an ASTM E74 calibration, and then we see them throw things in like nonlinearity. That should not belong here. This 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 is a decent sheet, but it does not calculate the degrees of freedom or the appropriate coverage factor. Um, it just basically combines everything, multiplies it by two, and says you're good. So nonlinear ha has no place uh, when the calibration was performed in accordance with the ASTM E74 standard. So we look at that one, and then we look at the one that we have developed. And this this one is online to download. This is the webinar today is why this is what we're discussing, um, where it, this sheet factors in stability, it factors in repeatability studies, reference laboratory, the uncertainty per points, all of this stuff, and then it and then it does uh, uncertainty analysis. Here I only showed two points, um, just for a brief overview. It plots your uncertainty uh, equation, which you could put on your scope of calibration. So this is really what you're gonna wanna download, and then I'm gonna take you through the process of what we're doing here and the example in the next next few slides. So 
If we have a calibration that's that we're we've done a E74 calibration and you get your data back, what we're going to want to do is we're going to look at all of the type A's and the type B's and the type A uncertainty contributors that you know the ASTM lower limit factor reduced to one standard deviation, uh, repeatability of the best existing device and repro repeatability and reproducibility, and then we have our type B contributors, which is resolution of the best existing device, reference standard resolution, if applicable applicable if you're using dead weight the you know the it may not have a resolution reference standard uncertainty reference standard stability environmental factors and we're going to look at other error sources so looking at this uh there are a few definitions that will pop up one is nonlinearity. i say you know that does not belong in an in, in an uncertainty uh budget that that was, is done in accordance with e74 that's the algebraic difference between the output on a specific load and corresponding point on a straight line drawn between the output at minimum load and maximum load and then we have hysteresis that's basically the descending we're going to draw the line and we're going to do a descending and then we talk about static error band and this is uh, the band of maximum deviations of ascending and descending calibration points from a best fit line through zero output it includes the effects of nonlinearity, hysteresis and non-return to minimal load and that's normally expressed as a percent of full scale this is one that if if you have a calibration you're using both a uh, load cell with ascending and descending measurements and you're not using in your calibration was not done in, in, in line with ISO 376, ASTM E74, or like the uh, Australian or other other standard where you just have, you know, nonlinearity and hysteresis. Static error bands a good number that can be substituted in our sheet for, for where we're looking at e, the ASTM lower limit factor. And our sheet allows for that, the Excel sheet allows for that. This example is dealing with E74, so we're going to we're going to deal with the lower limit factor. And what that is, it's a method of least squares uh, to fit a polynomial function to the data points. The standard deviation of all the deviations from the predicted values by the fit function versus the observed values is found by taking the square root of the sum of all the squared deviations divided by the number of samples minus the degree of polynomial fit used minus one. This number is multiplied by a coverage factor of 2.4 and then multiplied by the average ratio of force to deflection from the calibration data. So in general, E74 uses this equation and the calculations already done for us, our software already does it. So we're just going to take that ASTM lower limit factor, we're going to divide it by 2.4 and that's going to give us our standard deviation, which is a type A component. Now, when we talk about ASTM, there are two things to know. A primary force standard is a dead weight standard. This is this is that upper high tier of the pyramid. This is the you know the 10 to 50 part per million tier, and per definition, the weight shall be determined within you know 0.005% or better. And then we have secondary standards: load cells, proving rings, hydraulic machines. And the secondary standard uh, for the purpose of this discussion is that which has been calibrated by primary standards. So in this example, we're using our 2,000 pound portable calibrating machine. Uh, we have a load cell here. This is this load cell that I'm highlighting is our reference load cell. All we have is a calibration report from Morehouse who used a dead weight machine. And we're going to figure out, okay, I want to calculate my calibration and measurement capability for this, this machine. So what I need is I need another load cell because I'm going to use this second load cell to do my repeatability studies. And I'm going to have to account for the resolution and some other things. So what I need, I need the calibration report for the device, which is right here, certificate of calibration. I'm going to need the uncertainty of the instruments that were used to perform the calibration. That's the uncertainty of the reference. Calibration history, we're going to want that to track drift. Manufacturer specif specification sheet. Normally, we're just going to use this for environmental. And then other error sources, if known. Um, and then the end user is going to have to use that, that other load cell to conduct a repeatability study. And when they're doing that, it's a good time if you have multiple technicians to do R&Rs between those multiple technicians. And then, and then eventually, um, you're going to have to complete proficiency testing requirements, participate with NAPT, Sapphire, um, 
NCSLI is starting a proficiency program as well. So there's lots of options. You can always contact us. Uh, we have load cells where we could rent a load cell to you to do a, if you wanted to do a, a comparison with dead weights, if that's if that's something that was interested you're interested in. So type A uncertainty contributors. I said before we're going to use the ASTM lower limit uh, reduced to one standard deviation. So in compression, if we were doing a, a budget for compression, we may have to do one for both uh, compression and tension, depending on what, what we're doing. Uh, the lower limit factor, force units here, resolution is important, and that standard deviation. Um, so, But the standard deviation is in millivolts. The lower limit factor is 0 0.037. We have a loading range as defined by E74. But we're really important with what we really want is the resolution and the lower limit factor. So there's the definition. Uh, we're going to use ASTM lower limit factor. So in that example, we're going to use 0.21 force units and we're going to divide it by 2.4 to get one standard deviation so when we look at this on our on the next slide uh, we we would physically we were, we're going to enter 0 0.21 in but when we look at the next slide that's going to divide that point um, that number by 2.4 it gives us an ASTM lower limit factor of you know this number right here that's highlighted so We've entered in, getting ahead of things a little bit, we've entered in repeatability resolution. We've entered in all the stuff on this form. But when we look at going back to that uh, NRC sheet, uh, when we look at when we do things and get the degrees of freedom versus when we look at the NRC sheet, we get different values because it's so important uh, going back. These degrees of freedom, calculating this appropriate in the coverage factor is so important uh, in determining uncertainty to, to ensure that you have the 95% confidence. And if we look at this compared to what people are typically doing, we get a difference of 0 0.045 on the Morehouse sheet uh, versus this of 0 0.043. It's about a 5% difference, 4.5% difference. So looking through it um, and just comparing that first part, uh, it, there is a difference. Degrees of freedom need to be calculated to be in compliance with the standard. So as of now, we've basically just entered the ASTM lower limit factor, and we're going to do repeatability of the uh, best existing device. And if we're doing a full range, um, Repeatability is defined as the standard deviation of a series of at least two measurements at the same point. If we're doing a full range for calibration, if you bought the, you know, this 2,000 pound machine, you'd probably end up doing 20, at least 20 points throughout the range for repeatability. So recommended here, this example, you know, 10,000 Newton uh, device, we're saying take points at all of all of these points up to 10,000 newtons uh, to, to truly get the range because you're going to use different, uh, several different standards. Um, so a force measuring device should not be used to calibrate other devices outside the range it was calibrated over. Uh, a device calibrated from 10% to 100% of range should not be capable of calibrating devices outside the range. So if we have a 2,000 pound machine or this one 10,000 Newton machine, we have a 2,000 pound machine, we're probably going to need two load cells to do the full range. We're probably going to take a range of 200 to 2,000 and then probably another range of 20 or, or 20 to 200. And uh, all I'm saying is you, you, you're going to have to do multiple repeatability points. So on this example, say we're using that 2,000, going back to this example, we're using that 2,000 pound load cell. We're going to do a repeatability study um, and we're going to start, the first point is that 10% point of that range. So we're going to start at 200 pounds and we're going to take various test points. We're going to take the one load cell, we're going to lead load the reference to where it reads 200 and we're going to record what that other load cell, uh, the unit under test reads, and we're going to do repeatability study. And we're going to take it, we're going to do it four times, and we can do it throughout the range, but we're going to do, and if we do that, we do it four times, though we get a good load cell, a good stable load cell, it reads 200, 199.9, 199, and this is going to, this is going to take, this is going to do the repeatability of the best existing device, and this is going to go into our uncertainty budget. So, and then next we're going to do repeatability and reproducibility. So, we're going to do this between technicians. Uh, repeat, repeatability between technicians is found by taking the square root of the averages of the same test point taken multiple times. Reproducibility between technicians is found by taking the standard deviation of the averages of the same test points multiple times. So 
Repeatability and reproducibility between technicians, this should be need to be performed once per every parameter on the scope of accreditation and conducted amongst technicians who perform calibrations using the equipment. What I basically mean by this, our Excel spreadsheet has a separate tab to do this. We recommend at least doing 10 points. This example shows six. So you have one technician, you have them load the load cell to whatever force value you want. In this case, we're, I'm, I'm assuming we've loaded it to 2000. And then if you have a second technician, you have them load it to 2000. And you can do three, it does up to six technicians, you can add more. So basically you're comparing technicians and this is gonna give you the repeatability and reproducibility basically between technicians. Uh, readings were taken in millivolt per volt, and then we converted them to force unit. Our sheet will do this. You just need to click this tab if you want to convert to force units. You may be working in force units, so you you know you could just maybe call this 2000.00. So um, easily, our 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 sheet does all of this. Right now, what we've done is the highlighted area. We've 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 got the contributions for repeatability between technicians, reproducibility between technicians. We've entered the ASTM E74 lower limit factor, and then we've done a repeatability study at the 200 pound test point. Now we're ready to enter the type B. This is these are numbers that we're going to find from calibration history, uh, from other things. So on the type B side of things, we're going to look at the resolution, which is the smallest change in the quantity being measured that causes a perceptible change in the corresponding indication. And then we're going to look, we're going to talk about the best existing device. This is where you get that nice stable load cell, as I said, the two load cells, the one that was calibrated with dead weight, and then you have another as a standard to verify your machine. And that they typically define that as the best existing device. Uh, of course, you're going to want to use something with very, very good resolution that's very, very stable. It's defined as a device to be calibrated that is commercially or otherwise available for customers, even if it has a special performance stability or has a long history of calibration. Uh, for force calibrations, this is often a very stable load cell and indicator with enough resolution to observe differences in repeatability conditions. So. In this example, we have a good device. Uh, resolution of this device is 0 0.01 force units. And if we look at it, the resolution of that, and then we're going to have to also look at the resolution of the reference, and the resolution of our reference is 0 0.009 because we're using two secondary standards. So on type B, easily found, we've got the resolution of the best existing, and we've got the resolution of the reference that we've added. So, and then we're gonna look at the reference standard calibration uncertainty. This is usually the CMC of the reference standard used to calibrate the force measuring device. It is the uncertainty of the calibration of the calibration of the force measuring device. The repeatability study done for the CMC can be removed if a new repeatability with a, with a unit currently being calibrated is conducted. Basically, if that device was sent for calibration, um, you typically you want to get the the reference standard uncertainty. If if we if it was a repeatability study was done uh, on your specific device, you're going to want to pull that out. But a lot of times that doesn't happen. So what we're going to look at here is the on this in this example, 200 force units times 0.00. 1.6, it equals 0 0.003 force units, and then divide by the appropriate coverage factor. So right here's what we're looking for. We're gonna enter that in. This is gonna be that reference standard uncertainty. And we're gonna enter, that gets entered into the sheet. And then you look at the reference standard stability. Reference standard stability is the change in output from one calibration to another. Uh, it's found by comparing multiple calibrations against another over time. If the instrument is new, the suggestion is to contact the manufacturer for stability estimation on similar instruments. This should be on an any ASTM report as changed from previous, and the exact value change from one calibration to the next should be used. So our sheet, this is a guy uh, from our sheet, at the 200 pound point, the change from one calibration to another was about 0 .0, was 0.01%, so we enter that in. The actual value then becomes 0 0.02. Uh, uh, force units and we're going to enter that into our sheet and then after that we enter the environmental factors we're going to need to look at the load cell spec sheet plus or minus one degree celsius was used and this is found on the manufacturer specification sheet converting 0 0.08 divided 100 degrees gives us basically 0 0.0015 uh, per one degree C, and we're gonna use that number. We're gonna use that if we're, if we're calibrating in accordance with E74, our labs 
plus or minus one degree. If you have plus or minus five degrees, you would multiply five degrees C, you would multiply that by the appropriate number. Doing that, uh, 0 0.0015% per degree C, um, if we do that and we factor in the environmental conditions, by it's it ends up being 0 0.0034 force units. And then we get other error sources. Um, these it, This is machine dependent. If you're using a cow machine, uh, it's generally a 16th of an inch measured off the center line. We can find this on the load cell specif specification sheet under side load sensitivity. Again, that's only if you you have to measure it, you have to know it. Uh, if we're using this one, the specification sheet says side load sensitivity is 0.05%, and then we multiply that by the uh, the 16th of an inch, and we end up getting uh, 0, 0, 0. 0.003 percent, which is um, 0 0.15 force units. Uh, you could have other error sources, geometric alignment, timing, and contributors associated with using different indicators. If the device is calibrated with a different indicator than was used for calibration, uh, of course, that could produce a problem. Other error sources uh, that you may consider would be indicator uncertainty. If the system's not calibrated together, meaning you know you have a load cell, you have an indicator, you send that to, to the calibration service provider and they calibrate it together, then that's one thing. If you send them just the load cell and you're using a different indicator uh, or different excitation source or whatever, you're going to have to establish traceability for that different indicator. So if you're doing it, there's going to be another contribution that needs to be added there, indicator uncertainty for both the reference, the traceability of the reference laboratory that calibrated that cell, and and for the uh, traceability on the indicator that you're using that because it is different from the reference. Other error sources for force calibration, and we cover these in our two-day class in much more detail, but cable stiffness and mounting, uh, mass instead of force weights, misalignment, thread depth on a column load cell, loading through bottom threads and compression, calibration of button cells, cable length, four wire versus six wire, not following published standards, that's certainly an error source. It also negates traceability. Uh, different excitation voltage, errors from used batteries, you know, batteries not fresh, can the meter, does the meter regulate it properly? Molecule excitement decline, proper pin size with tension lengths, ascending versus descending curves, not using the appropriate adapters, timing errors, appropriate exercise cycles, especially when switching modes, not switching standards to verify the uh, entire loading range. You know, if you want to maintain a very, very low, uh, a low CMC, lots of times you're going to have to switch multiple standards. Uh, flatness, of, flatness of load cell and adapters, uh, that can be a huge error source. Um, difference in technicians and how to quantify uh the best way to do that is is to do your gauge r and r's to use uh, the excel sheet to do that thread depth errors on shear web um load cells that's another source so looking at that for cmc for e74 calibrations these are all the things that we entered into the the cert and that if you download that Excel sheet, there's tabs, there's there's little red uh, arrows that tell you everything and what you need to do. But we did this for the 200 pound point. We entered every, you know, enter everything in, do the do the repeatability study, uh, the repeat, reproducibility between texts, um, and the repeatability between texts is constant throughout the range, so that only needs to be done once. We did our repeatability study. We'd we'd entered everything else into the equation. And our next thing now is we're going to have to go back. We did 200 pounds. We're going to go back and do 400. Then we do 600. Then we do, you know, 800. Um, so and we just do the repeatability for more of the range. But when we use uh, Wells Sather weight with in, infinite degrees of freedom for type B, um, this is just something to note. It may not represent the true uncertainty as the coverage factor would increase without infinite degrees of freedom. But um, I just say that because that's a debate for another day. Typically, we, we're going to set the, these degrees of freedoms, this column, to, to 200 or more, and it's not going to make a difference. But if we reduce them all to one, it gives us a little bit different answer. And usually the NMIs are, are, are from my understanding, are doing these, um, are using the degrees of freedom as one because the Welsh Sather weight can can obscure things. But uh, in any case, uh, it's just something to consider. 
But so we look at this, we look at our four CMC for ASTM E74 calibrations. We've done everything, um, here, the different contributors here. And if you look at this repeatability, um, if we look at this graph, repeatability is our largest uncertainty contributor from what, what I've just showed you. And then the next step, as I said before, is to do the same thing um, for the 400 pound point, the 600 pound or whatever you're doing for the range. And these are the things that 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 may change. Um, you've you've typed everything in. You're going to have to do repeatability at the next point for sure. And the reference standard uncertainty, depending on the Cal Lab, if they change standards, you're going to have to the the reference for that test point or the uncertainty for that test point may have changed. So we have a sheet that can be downloaded. Uh, it can be downloaded online. It's going to show. It's going to allow you to put in all types of points, uh, different things. And the other point I need to make uh, today, uh, people are confusing this, is ASTM E74 is not ISO 376. If you are out there and you're doing calibrations to ISO 7500, you need unique calibration in accordance with ISO 376. Uh, you cannot use the ASTM calibration to perform an ISO 7500 calibration. ISO 376 has several requirements that are not requirements of a ASTM E74. Uh, ISO ASTM is going to test this reproducibility, but ISO 376 also does repeatability. Uh, they do interpolation. They do zero reversibility, possibly, or creep. And then ranges are classified and expanded uncertainty of the applied force is, these are the tolerance limits here on the right. It's an entirely different procedure, but our, our form will allow you to use do an ISO, do uncertainty, or CMCs for ISO 376 if needed. So looking at our form in a lot more detail here, here it is. This is what you would see if you would pull up the form on the Excel sheet. You can enter your laboratory, technician initials, the date it was calibrated, the range, um, standard use, and then we have these red tabs. If you click on them, pull up all diff all kinds of different information here this says ASTM E74 this is a drop down box where you can change to change it to SEB or ISO uh, ISO 376 type of calibration and then you have the resolution of the reference so we're just going to enter all these in in the sheets it's real easy to use temperature spec per degree C max temperature variation uh, we're going to enter the reference lab CMC um, miscellaneous error. If you're non E74, you come down to this line right here that I'm highlighting. It says non 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 E74. Um, if you're in millivolts, you can convert your repeatability data. It'll re report it, uh, do that uh, to engineering units. And then you fill basically all those sheets and all that information that I just showed you is all filled out on this form. Um, you have your force applied. You fill your reference standard stability fill that out up here throughout the range. Uh, the temperature effect will auto-populate. Um, there's, if you're using ISO 376, you can use the uncertainty coefficients for the 376 cal that you should get, get with that report. Uh, the reference standard uncertainty per point will populate. If there's different, different ones, you can select per point, you know, if it's engineering units or if it's a percentage. And then it allows up to four repeatability points and up to 12 points. If you're doing two ranges, you may want a high range and a low range. Uh, if this were a true analysis, we'd do 200, 400, you know, we do steps of 200 um, uh, on, this, on this one load cell instead of just, you know, instead of just two points i just use two points to to demonstrate the again to demonstrate the concept but everything's there you can click on average standard deviation of the runs and 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 the tabs um if you're unsure of anything just just pull up just click this little these little red tabs and they'll pull lots of different information up for you so really uh what i recommend is anybody that wants to do this is to download our download the Excel sheet and just look at it, read it. Um, this webinar is specifically was what's behind that Excel sheet. And it was done very, very quickly. Um, so reviewing the PDF of this and, and going back and listening to it would tell you more, more of what's behind it, um, the actual what 
what needs to be included in the budget, uh, what the definitions of those things are, and uh, just the general sense of how you perform a cal how to you do your uh, calibration and measurement capability uh, to meet the ILAC P14 and uh, ISO 17025 and the accreditation body requirements. So the example I used was an ASTM example because a lot of people get that one wrong and uh, the other ones are certainly up for debate. So if anybody here is, we did the E74 tier, but the next tier down would be like uh, if you're doing an E4 tier and on the E4 tier, uh, you would have different things, uh, typically on the E4 care, uncertainty of the reference lab, um, plus the resolution of your device, um, expected performance of the load cell, uh, typically quarter percent for class A, same same type of stuff, just a little different, U resolution, U repeatability, U environment, U stability, U indicator, if, if, if it's not married as a system, again, I absolutely recommend people marrying it as a system. And then you have the other sources could be, other error sources could be from uncertainty, from off axis, timing, repeatability, and uh, of course other error sources. So everybody uh, today, if, if you're not a customer of ours and you want to send us certi calibration certificates from other force calibration suppliers, I showed you some bad examples. I showed you some bad CMCs uh, that just were not believable. We're happy to look at those. Um, if you want to try us for calibration, we will perform a calibration, send you the data, and and our guarantee is you only pay if we meet if we meet your needs. Uh, we also have uh, exclusive Excel templates. Um, that after this webinar, if you want them, we have PFA calculator templates to calculate risk to comply with ANSI C540.3 method. It's method five and six now. Uh, the new standards out, so so th this is going to become something. You know, you're going to have to make this decision on how do you say something is in or, in or out of tolerance. Access to upcoming information, upcoming webinars, free merchandise, promotions, online training. If you know, if you want a webinar, a two hour, three hour webinar, and we go over uncertainty in more detail and you want that for your company, we're happy to do it uh, if you have enough people uh, and uh, open the mics and get all the questions. Uh, articles on force torque, the, we have papers, uh, we have exclusive offers on force calibrating equipment and training, uh, time-saving tips using lean manufacturing for the calibration lab. Um, so all these things, you please sign up if you're not for a force measurement insider. I think it gives a lot of value. And it, when you get the PDF copy of this, you can click the links. So general, general summary, it's basically like, you know, repeating. Uh, just repetition when you're when you're doing the uh, uncertainty uh, analysis, um, you're gonna you're gonna enter the stuff in, and then you're gonna have to do the repeatability study and the R and R between technicians. And after you do all of this, it's real simple. Does all the calculations for you. Um, again, um, it makes it uh, Morehouse equals MC3. That's Stillip Shaw's company. Uh, Excel spreadsheet makes calculating calibration and measurement capability easier as long as the right information is entered. So uh, garbage in, garbage out, right information in, the right stuff comes out. So uh, hopefully this gave you a pretty good oversight of the right information that needs to be put in. We covered calculating CMC when using ASTM E74 and mentioned how to use the sheet for ISO 376. And the other thing, we have a draft copy of how to cal how calculate CMC for other scenarios if anybody is interested. So with that, uh, if anybody has questions, I am going to answer them in the chat bar here. And I'm going to open the mics. Uh, the first question I have is, can you explain mass weights versus force weights? I absolutely, absolutely can explain that. That's a great question. Mass weights are not correct. Force weights require, force is mass times acceleration. So you have some of it there with your mass weight. Uh, with mass weights, um, or with force weights, you force weights require the additional correction for air buoyancy, local gravity, and material density. So you get all these things together, and we have a nice blog on if you have a mass weight and want to convert to force the things you need to do. Uh, typically, you'll get your longitude, latitude. You log into a, a website, type in, and it'll give you the appropriate corrections. And from there, you can you can say, hey, I have uh, 
100 pounds of mass and I'm at this longitude and this latitude when I make the corrections for you know air density and gravity this is going to be this is going to it's going to equate to you know 100 and 0.453 pounds uh, pounds force so excellent question thank you any other questions